Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I will be answering all your YouTube Q&A questions. This is part two. I will link the first video below, but I just could not answer all the questions in the first video. I'll do my best not to have these questions overlap, but there are some recurring themes with the questions. So let's just get started. What gave you the motivation to continuously make content when you were starting out? So when I started my channel, my very first upload was late. 2019 and I did it with the intention with the goal of becoming monetized as fast as possible and earning revenue as fast as possible because for me YouTube and all the work that is required <laughs> to have a YouTube channel it wasn't worth my time just to do for fun I wanted some kind of a return on my investment and so with YouTube there is a certain number of watch hours and subscribers that you need to meet before YouTube starts putting ads and you start earning ad revenue. And I knew that in order to get to those milestones, you needed to basically upload as much as possible, as frequently as possible, because that's what gets your videos traction. That's what gets the videos out into the YouTube algorithm and gets new viewers. So even though initially I was seeing the same typical slow growth that many other new YouTubers see, I just pushed through, I persevered <laughs> because I knew that eventually, hopefully, I would reach that monetization goal and start receiving some income from YouTube. And so that's the pitfall of many new YouTubers is that they don't necessarily get that viral video that they may think is very easy. That's actually hard to achieve for many people. And if they're not seeing instant growth, they can give up and you can't give up. You have to keep doing it. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So I just had to keep doing it, even though a lot of my videos in the early days were not great. <laughs> Some of them completely tanked and I just had to keep going and just not give up. So yeah, what gave me the motivation was envisioning that, okay, eventually I will be monetized. I will make money from this and there will be a reward to all this hard work that I put in. How do you avoid the feeling of potentially being judged by your peers about what you do? Maybe it's because of my age and, you know, I'm in my late 30s. I'm at the age where I just can't care and don't care about what a lot of other people think about me. That's what stopped me from kind of starting my channel was, oh my gosh, what if someone from my high school sees it or whatever. I just didn't care anymore. <laughs> I just didn't care. So how do you avoid the feeling? You really can't avoid that feeling. If you have that feeling that someone's gonna judge you, you just have to own it and then deal with it. The way I dealt with it was I just didn't care. Now, if you mean peers by my coworkers, I wasn't necessarily worried that they would see it, but I would probably rather that they not see it <laughs> because obviously, you know, the subject matter of my videos are luxury shopping and kind of superficial things. And I just maybe didn't want my coworkers to think, okay, all I care about are bags, which obviously that's not the only thing I care about, but that is what I talk about on my channel. People who aren't familiar with, with that world and with luxury bags and shopping, they might think that's the only thing in my life. And obviously that's not the case. So I just try not to care. And I think I've succeeded. I really don't care if people judge me. There are a lot of people who judge me. If my peers judge my character based on some YouTube videos that I put out, then I mean, that's really on them, but it doesn't affect my life, I guess. So that's how I kind of deal with that feeling. I don't really care if they judge me negatively. Now, staying on the topic of judgmental viewers, the next question is, how do you deal with haters? And have you gotten an apology from one of your haters? <laughs> I've gotten a couple questions about this because the way that I deal with my haters, quote unquote, is that I started a series called responding to my hate comments or reacting or reading my hate comments, reacting to my hate comments. I just find these comments that I get on some of my videos, just a few videos in particular that have sparked a lot of controversy. Most notably, my most viewed video with over a million views is how LV employees deal with counterfeits being brought into the boutique. There was a lot of angry commenters and those commenters sometimes spill over into my Instagram DMs. I was getting literal death threats, <laughs> which is just so insane. And the way I deal with it is, again, I turned it into a series responding to them. I just truly think it's so funny that there is so much outrage over just bags and there's a lot of perceived slights and offense taken by just me stating the facts about my personal experience as a former LV employee. I just talked about what happened when counterfeits were brought into the store, how we handle those 
interactions with clients. So I guess it was triggering to some people. Sorry if you were triggered, but it just was my personal experience. But how I deal with that is I started a series responding to those comments because I just think they're so funny. So check out those responding to my hate comments videos. I just think they're kind of funny. I enjoyed you in those videos. Oh, and have you gotten an apology from one of your haters? So not quite. There were two in particular. One of them was a cuticle Karen because she was passive aggressively commenting in my videos saying that my nails were crusty and that I needed to moisturize my cuticles. And I turned it around and thanked her for watching and I like my nails too or something like that. And she tried to disguise it passive aggressively as girl power, but then she continued in my other videos commenting about my nails and I was just like, okay. That's, that's okay, thanks for watching. So she had kind of a passive aggressive apology because I guess she was surprised that I responded to her comment about my nails, you know, thanking her for supporting me. So yeah, she said, sorry, I just noticed your nails, love your videos. And it's like, okay, do you love my videos? <laughs> it's an interesting reaction when I respond to these really negative comments with thank you, like genuine thanks. Thanks for supporting, thanks for engaging, thanks for watching. Sometimes they respond with surprise and maybe embarrassment that they were kind of caught or called out for being so rude. Kind of an apology. Oh, there was another guy who commented in one of my videos saying that I looked like an adult film actress. I think I hearted his comments. I was going through the comments and just, you know, liking most of them. And he came back and said, wow, not only did you not delete my comment, but you liked it, new subscriber. And so he subscribed to my video. So I guess that was his way of apologizing for comparing me to a, an adult film actress. So yeah. I don't know if I answered this in the first video. I talked somewhat about sponsorships, but this question, what's the weirdest sponsor request you've received? And I mentioned that I get a ton of sponsorship ad gifting requests. And a lot of times, most of the time, I actually turn it down because their subject matter has nothing to do with my channel, things that I have never talked about or am willing to talk about. So the most off brand, I think, are gaming sponsorships because I'm not a gamer, I don't game. I think the majority of my audience leans older and just not into gaming either. So I don't think my audience is a good fit for <laughs> gaming sponsorships. And then probably the weirdest sponsor request were for adult toys and other paraphernalia. <laughs> not to, you know, shame anyone, do whatever you want but that's just not on my channel. And, and that's actually something that is sometimes controversial on YouTube because if that is your content, which that's great, but it is a little problematic in terms of monetization. You can be demonetized if that is the subject matter of your video. And that's like a death blow to a lot of YouTubers. Of course, no one wants to get demonetized, but that's what happens when you even mention adult related activities. So I try to steer clear. So those are the weirdest requests I get. Sticking to sponsorships and PR, what is the best PR gift you've gotten? I have been very blessed to work with a lot of great brands, a lot of great companies. Not only do I see products that I'm genuinely interested in and have already been using for a long time, but then some companies will send gifts as a thank you for, you know, working with them. One company I partnered with recently is called Second Life Jewels and they sent me over a beautiful package of repurposed, recycled, upcycled jewelry that was made from vintage charms, you know, vintage hardware taken from luxury designers. And they're a great company, it's a small business, I love to support small business. So not only did they send me this jewelry to work with them and to promote, but then after, you know, we did a giveaway video and everything and we still support each other. <laughs> and then after all that, as a thank you, they sent me the most beautiful Gucci scarf, but it was just very thoughtful, very sweet. And yeah, I would say that was probably my best PR gift. Okay, another money question. How long did it take you before your YouTube channel became profitable? My journey was a little different because I started off with a somewhat large Instagram following and I was already approved through these affiliate linking commission websites. So if I linked an affiliate link for a product, and someone on my Instagram clicked through that link and purchased that product, then I would earn a, a very small commission. So through those platforms, I was able to use those links and insert them into my videos even before I was monetized by YouTube. So with YouTube, your main revenue sources are YouTube AdSense, like your Google AdSense revenue. That's from your YouTube views essentially and viewing ads, your viewers watching ads. And then the second is affiliate links. Again, you have to meet a certain threshold to be monetized 
on YouTube. And it took me about three months to reach that thousand subscriber and 4,000 watch hour threshold to be monetized. But because I was already approved for affiliate links, I was able to make a very small profit from my affiliate links in my YouTube videos. And I would say it was profitable pretty much immediately because I, again, had very little startup costs in that it was zero. I used my iPhone to film everything. I used my window lighting, natural lighting to film. I didn't have fancy mics or I didn't have a laptop. My initial cost to start was zero dollars. And then I was already earning a very slight profit through my affiliate links with my first video. And then I eventually became monetized in three months. And that timeline isn't always the same with a lot of other YouTubers. Some YouTubers, it takes years to be monetized through AdSense. And they also aren't approved for affiliate linking commissions yet until they gain a certain number of followers. So it's like a chicken and the egg situation for smaller, smaller YouTubers who are just starting out. If you can have an Instagram following, that helps, I guess is my advice. Do you feel that you need to buy more luxury to make more content? No, absolutely not. I refuse to buy something just for the sake of making a video. I will not buy something because I think it's trendy if I don't personally like it. Or, and even, I won't even accept as a gift from companies, you know, a lot of companies will try to gift me things in order for me to promote them, but I don't even like to accept it if I know that it's not something that, that I'm interested in or doesn't work with my channel. Again, going back to the adult activities, <laughs> anything like that, I'm just like, no, thank you. I'm not going to be showing that on my channel, showing that on my Instagram, you know, thanks, but no thanks for that gift. But in terms of buying luxury, I definitely don't buy, not even just luxury, but anything, contemporary brands, inexpensive stuff. I don't buy anything just for the sake of making more content. I'm not running out of ideas or videos for content. So I have a lot that I can work with. I have a lot of ideas a lot of videos on the way. There are already a lot of things that I want to buy anyway, just on my own. And there are a lot of things that I buy that I don't even talk about on my channel. There are some YouTubers, I don't know them personally, but I am aware that some people will buy things just to make a video and then return it. I just, you know, do whatever you want, but that's not something I do. I hate returning things if I have to. I did make a few returns recently because I just, it didn't work out when it arrived. I don't buy things just to make videos. I buy things, if I like it, then I'll make a video about it. That's just how it works with me. If I like something, I'll buy it. If I can figure out a video, then I'll make a video about it. But that's how it works with me. I don't buy things for the sake of making videos, if that makes sense, especially not luxury things. Okay, and the last question, what was the breakthrough moment that made you realize you could be a full-time YouTuber? Now, just to be clear, I don't consider myself a full-time YouTuber. I still consider myself to be a full-time stay-at-home mom who does YouTube on the side versus a working mom who does YouTube on the side. <laughs> I am first and foremost a stay-at-home mom to my three kids, but I would say the breakthrough moment that made me realize I could quit my corporate law job and stay at home and do YouTube on the side was probably last year when I put out a bunch of videos that one after the other, they all were viral. They just all went viral and my AdSense revenue skyrocketed. And that was the first time that I was earning monthly six figures. Now I would say that a lot of it had to do with my unique video ideas, but another big part that factored into the fact that my videos went viral was the pandemic. And now that I'm saying this, it actually was two years ago. So it was the 2020, like that August, September, I just had a bunch of videos that went viral and it was pretty crazy. And that was when I was like, wow, I can, really probably quit my job soon. If, if, if it keeps up at this rate, I can definitely just quit and then do this on the side. It did help that my videos went viral. It didn't stay that way. It goes up and down and then it, you know, kind of went down again, but then there was a point where my videos were again going viral. And that's just always so exhilarating. I think once all that income was consistently earning me six figures monthly, then I definitely was like, okay, I can seriously consider quitting my job and doing YouTube full-time or being at home full-time. So yeah, it can happen. It's possible. It can happen to anyone. I, you just got to put the work in upfront and then you can reap the rewards later. I hope you enjoyed my video. Thank you so much for asking all these questions. I definitely hope to answer more of your questions. If you have any more, drop it in the comments below. I will follow up, like I said, advice about how to be a YouTuber, how to start your channel. I'll do a full video breakdown showing the income by month, by year, 
by video and showing you how it all works out with AdSense and affiliates and all that. But I hope you enjoyed this YouTube Q&A. Thanks so much for watching and I will catch you in my next video. Bye.